You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Valerie Tripp on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's the first book in the Absolute Hero series. It's called Izzy Newton and the Smart Squad. And SMART is S-M-A-R-T, all uh, uh, abbreviated there. And uh, Valerie's going to tell us all about it today. Welcome to the show, Valerie. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, Hank. I'm excited to have you, Valerie. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I know this one. As a matter of fact, I have in my drawer an autobiography I wrote when I was seven. And I am sorry to admit to you, Hank, that a great deal of it was untrue. (laughs) <laughs> already at seven, I was fictionalizing even my own life. And uh, there were illustrations. And yes, it was quite elaborate. So it was clear to me even at, at seven, that writing was a wonderful thing to do. I think mostly because my parents would read section, they would read, my mother would say, oh, listen to this beautiful paragraph. And she would read a paragraph out loud to my father. So I realized from a very early, before I could read or write myself, you know, writing well is something to be proud of. That, that's a, that's a skill to be proud of. So I think even before I knew how to read and write myself, the idea of being a writer was very, very appealing. And then evidently by the time I was seven, I was already writing the story of my life. I love that. Um, I also love that that you talk about writing in a in a visceral way, like the your your parents uh, sharing uh, uh, you know portions of a story out loud, and there there is something uh, intrinsically beautiful about a, a well written sentence and a well constructed paragraph, and and the the way that. Uh, that prose flows uh, in in a certain way. There's a, it's more than just words on the page, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely is. It's how it hits your ear It how it sort of, you know, reverberates in your torso. It has to feel right in addition to, you know, sounding right. And, and, and even beyond the meaning of the words, the way it sounds and the rhythm of the sentence has to let you know something about the purpose of that sentence. And, I think really it's my mother who deserved tremendous credit because in addition to calling attention to well-written paragraphs, she did not hesitate to call attention to poorly written sentences that she saw her (laughs) children writing. So from the, from the beginning, I understood, okay, this is, this is not something you that's perfect the first time out. And it's you, it's a generous thing to be a writer. Um, And part of that generosity is, you know, you have to be sure you're, writing in such a way that you're communicating the ideas that are inside your head. If it's going to be worth the person's time to read what you have written, it has to be worth your time to write it correctly. And I really have to give my mother credit for that. She was a wonderful writer. People still have thank you notes that she wrote to them. They've saved her thank you notes because she expressed herself so well. And she was so funny in her, in the notes. Well, your mother was on to something uh, that that I don't think uh, gets a lot of credit is there's so much to learn from a poorly constructed sentence as there is a well constructed sentence. And, <laughs> and if you're brave enough to face up, you know, to your poorly constructed sentences, then then uh, that can be a learning experience as well, can't it? Yes. And, you know, I should tell you, too, I also have it. Children always get a kick out of it when I in the old days when we used to be able to go to schools to make speeches and meet the children. I have a piece of writing that I did. um, I think I must have been eight. And my teacher has written on the back of this paragraph that I wrote. 
please save this and give it to Valerie on her wedding day. And it is an essay about February saying, you know, there's Lincoln's birthday and there's, there's Valentine's day, there's Lincoln's birthday and there's Washington's birthday. And for some reason, my teacher felt that this was such priceless prose. My mother should keep it and give it to me on my wedding day. Can you imagine? Oh, that's amazing. That <laughs> but again, amazing. the point was writing is important and something to be taken seriously. So what uh, what did your parents um, do for a living? Um, My mother taught English. My mother was a substitute. She, she, she used to say she was she was an oxymoron because she was a permanent <laughs> substitute. She would be you know long term substitute at high school. So she was a very she was uh, she loved to read and she loved English literature and she had been a Latin teacher. So she would you know she she would say stuff like you know um, a more. Amor amatamas from the Latin, da, da, da. she would, you know, conjugate things right in the midst of a sentence. And then my father also deserves tremendous credit because not only was his job in advertising, so he used to say in his job, he was writing words people didn't even want to hear. <laughs> he had to convince them that they wanted to hear, and they really didn't. And then he would, he would also deserves a lot of credit because he had this lovely deep voice and he read aloud to my sisters and my brother and me, and he would read Charlotte's web and fairy tales and the Beverly Cleary books. And he made it clear. He loved the stories as much as we did. He would laugh and laugh and laugh. And that also showed us, okay, something that is well-written. This is a book that is written for children, but it's so well-written that my father is enjoying it as well. So they really taught us um, what a wonderful thing it was to have something that people enjoyed to, to write something people would enjoy reading. I love that so much. Um, and and I, I think that maybe subliminally um, your father transferred uh, to you the fact that uh, that stories can uh, can hit us on on multiple different levels that that maybe a story is constructed for children, uh, but then maybe there are uh, things about the story that uh, that communicate to adults uh, in a different way that uh, that, you know, that, that language can be layered like that, um, which, yeah. which is which is fascinating when you discover that. Yes. Yes. I think that I think that's really true. And is, haven't you found that, too, Hank, that's also, you know, you'll read, let's say you read Romeo and Juliet when you're 14 and you think, oh, this is the most romantic thing I've ever read. Then you reread Romeo and Juliet when you're a little bit older and you think, oh, those kids, oh my gosh, this is a terrible mistake they're making. <laughs> and you realize, you know, their parents weren't all, you know, their parents are probably in their late twenties or something. And at different points in your life, you can read the same thing and have a completely different reaction to it because you've changed. And the, because the piece of writing is so rich, as you say, it's layered and you're reacting to a different layer at a different point in your life. I remember when my children were small and I was reading uh, the Chronicles of Narnia to them. And, uh, you know, we we started with the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And, you know, it it seems like the story is written um, to small children. And there are certain aspects of the language where um, things are, are kind of obvious uh, if you're approaching it in a, in a childlike way and, and you're communicating directly to a small child. But when you're the adult reading it, you're like, oh, Lewis is, is really, um, you know, he's, he's going deep here on, on different uh, subjects. I, I can't pull an exact example out of the air. I'm trying to on the fly. And, but that, that, that's, you know, a, a great, constructed story does that. And, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, maybe we're, we're losing some of the appreciation for that as we get into the wow. world of, of YouTube and Netflix and, um, wow. you know, where, where story time is, it doesn't have as prominent a role, uh, in our American families as, as maybe it once did. You know, uh, when I used to visit classrooms too, when you read aloud to a group of children, their whole body language changes. They relax. You yes. know, you, they, you, it, it's, they're almost mesmerized and, and they're, they're absorbed and you just see them almost suspended in time. If it's a good story, you're right. It's a love. And I think that reading aloud 
is lovely. It gives you a shared vocabulary with your child. You know, in our family, we're still making jokes about Otis Spofford and various characters in the <laughs> Beverly Clary books. And I, I think that, that then when a child reads for himself or herself, um, they're using their imagination muscle. I, I always say to my readers, you're my partner here. You're my partner. I, I write the story, but 50% of this is you and what you're bringing to it. And what you picture when you write this sentence is might not be the same thing that I pictured. And this, you have to put, you have to flex that imagination muscle and meet me halfway on this and make the story into a story. Absolutely. Um, so Valerie, you went to Yale University, is that right? Yes, I did. Yeah, I was in the first co-educated class, actually. Wow. What did you go to study there? Well, uh, thank you for asking. I was much too shy to take any classes in writing fiction. Just way too shy. Couldn't couldn't have, have done that. So I decided uh, that to, uh, to get my money's worth, I should major in philosophy because I knew me and I knew that I would read Jane Eyre and 19th century novels, and you wouldn't be able to stop me reading, but that I need, I should major in something where I wouldn't be able to navigate the reading by myself, that I would need someone to help me through uh, the philosophy. And I loved it. And I have to say too, my dear father said to me, okay, so now let me get this straight. You're going to major in philosophy. And does that mean after you graduate, you're planning to get a job as a philosopher? I just don't, <laughs> think we really have jobs for philosophers. <laughs> and here's what happened, Hank. I mean, this is, this, I love this. I ended up, you know, writing the American Girl stories, which take pretty complicated historical, political, social, economic concepts and translating them into the clearest possible language. I learned that skill from reading philosophy in college. And in order to understand it and remember it myself at all, I had to basically translate it into bullet point sentences, just as clear as they could be so that I could get it straight in my head and remember it. And now with Izzy Newton and uh, the Smart Squad, it's the same thing. I take scientific concepts and I have to tell the whole story honestly about the scientific concept in the most straightforward po possible manner and not tell anything that's misleading or extraneous, but be sure I've been thorough. So believe it, I think my father would be very happy to know that that training in philosophy turned out to be exactly what I needed to do my work. Papyrus Author was designed and developed with the modern writer's needs, wishes, and preferences in mind. From big structures right down to tiny details, every single feature of our software has been carefully and meticulously crafted in collaboration with authors. Take charge of your writing with the author interface, which gives you access to different elements of your story, such as characters, backgrounds, and narrative structure. Move sections of your writing seamlessly in the navigator and evaluate the complexity of your text with our expert style and readability analysis. Never worry about losing progress with automated backups. With Papyrus Author, you can be your own writer, editor, and publisher. The world of writing is about to change. Papyrus Author, the word processor for authors, has arrived on the international stage. Unrivaled in its scope, it is the first software suite to unite every single step of creative writing. The vision behind Papyrus Author is to empower everyone with an idea to turn it into a great book for free. A word processing core that matured for over 10 years at its foundation, Papyrus Author goes beyond the text with its intuitive organizing layers for story, characters, notes, and research. The powerful style and readability analysis help raise manuscript quality. The inbuilt publication capabilities take the book directly to the reader with ebooks, docx, and print ready PDF. Visit papyrusauthor.com to get started today. That is amazing. Uh, now I'll have to uh, call up a couple of my kids and apologize for um, <laughs> some of the, the comments I made <laughs> about college courses. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you you alluded to um, the fact that you uh, wrote the American Girl series and, and quite a number of the books in that. What led to uh, 
to to this um, part of your career because if you've if you've raised you know, daughters, especially in the last twenty years, you you know what the American Girl series is. Um, how did this come about, and how did you get to be involved with it? Well, I I still work for American Girl sometimes, and I do love it. I absolutely love uh, doing the historical research and writing those stories. And th- one of the most lovely parts of writing for American Girl was the fact that it meant that I met, met thousands of girls at brownie troops and classrooms and church groups and book signings. And um, I would very often be asked to speak to girls and their mothers or um, in, at school libraries. And one of my favorite schools to go to is just up the street here. Uh, my friend Carolyn Johnson is the librarian. And one day she called me and said, Valerie, could you make us be a substitute speaker last minute um, tomorrow because my speaker can't make it? And I said, oh, sure, Carolyn, that sounds like fun to me. So I went and it was at that luncheon making that speech that I met a lovely young woman named Rebecca Baines, who was the head of National Geographic Kids Publications. And she said, would you ever I don't know, would you ever be interested in writing a fiction? We're National Geographic Kids is thinking getting getting into fiction. Would you be interested in doing a fiction series? And I said, oh my gosh, Rebecca, I would love to do that. That would be a dream. And it, it has been a dream come true to write this series with National Geographic. So it was kind of a fluky thing, really, just a fluky thing that I met Rebecca. And it led to writing this series that I've just enjoyed tremendously. That, that is so amazing because uh, life is full of it serendipitous is. moments like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. you, you know, yes. we, we we talk a lot on this show about um, the things that you can do to uh, to hone your craft and, um, you know, to to make things happen and, you know, uh, learning to write the best story that you can write and learning to communicate with people and and all of the things that go into being a writer. But sometimes it's just serendipity that just puts you in the right right place with the right people at the right time, isn't it? Yes. And I'll tell you another thing, Hank, one of the joys and frustrations of writing is that you have to be present and you have to be sitting focused, but some days, well, you probably know this, you know, some days it just flows out and you're clicking and other days it's like digging a ditch and it's just not you know what I mean? It's just not working. And sometimes yeah. I'll get a manuscript back and the editor will have circled a sentence and I won't even remember writing that sentence. And she'll say, okay, this is a gorgeous sentence. And I'll think, I don't even remember writing that. Then, a, you know, a sentence that it took me a week, blood, sweat, and tears, she'll say, now we're going to have to cut this one. This one doesn't work at all. It's so, it, 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 it's just, as you say, I, I, you don't know when you're, when everything's going to fall in place for you to start a project. And you, I also don't know which sentences and which paragraphs and which ideas are going to be ones that are just going to sing right off the page and which ones, no matter how hard you dig away at them, just kind of really aren't going to work. Right. So talking about the American Girl series, um, you you mentioned how, you know, studying philosophy helped you to sort of unlock the code of, of writing these books and taking very complex issues and learning how to communicate those uh, to your audience. What was the creative process like for that series of books and, and uh, that, that you did do and that maybe you're still working on? Do you begin with a concept and then construct a story around that? Do you begin with a character? How does, how did those books begin for you? Usually what happens, what happened which was that I would become interested in a period of history. From the very beginning, I said to Pleasant Roland, who is the creator of American Girl, I think we should do a story that ta- takes place during the Great Depression because it made such a difference to so many people. And she would always say, mm, not yet, not yet. So we start, I started with Molly. And then I went on to Samantha and Felicity and Josefina and then finally did Kit. So in some cases, it would be a pebble in my shoe that I was just determined. I just really wanted to write that certain story. 
In other cases, um, sometimes American Girl would come to me. For example, in the case of Mary Ellen, my character who lived in the 1950s, American Girl said, hey, just if you were going to write a story about a girl living in the 50s, what would you do? How would you do it? And my next step in writing those books is always to come on the what I feel is the crucial issue of the period. For example, with Mary Ellen, I thought she's a baby boomer baby uh, in 1954, that her issue would be, how is she a unique person in the crowd? So her issue is conformity versus diversity. Once I have that crucial issue, then I know what my character's personality is going to be like, what her life situation is going to be like, because her life is kind of a girl-sized version of that major issue. Felicity is an easy one to explain. She wants more independence than a girl would have had in the 18th century. And so too, of course, the colonies want their independence from the king. So you can see that I set up that parallel. In some cases, it's me asking, please, may I do this character? In the case of Josefina, I remember saying, you know, I was taught that the pilgrims landed in, you know, 16, 19, 16, 20. But then the next thing I we, we hear about is, you know, it, it's such an Eastern story that I'm getting here. What was going on in the West Coast during all of this time? I don't hear anything again for a long, long time. And what was going on? And sure enough, there's a vivid story of the settlement of the West coming up through Mexico. So sometimes it's just a question I have. Sometimes it's a period of history I think is essential. And then sometimes American Girl would come to me and say, how about, how would you handle this period of history? So it was, wasn't always the same way every time. When you're writing stories for a younger audience, um, do you have um, uh, any first readers or uh, do you try out material for a younger audience to see, uh, you know, am I connecting uh, with the audience that I intend to? Or how do you make sure that uh, other than your educational background, of course, how do you make sure that you are um telling a story that that is going to land the way that you want it to with the audience that you want it to? Well, if the history, if we start, if I started with the historical period, really at the same moment, I always start being inspired by my reader and I have my reader in mind all the time, you know, kind of uh, an eight-year-old girl for the American Girl books. And I want to be sure to engage her. I want her to care about what is going on in the story. I want her to become friends with my main character. So I try to find elements of her life in the 21st century that might not have been all that different, no matter when the character lived. Things like getting along with your siblings, the things that you're learning to do, the both challenge and pride of new responsibilities. So I try to kind of create this ribbon of connection between my reader and my character. And the ribbon's made up of things they have in common. And it's also, of course, emotion. I want there to be affection between my reader and my character. To answer your question specifically, in the old days when my daughter was little, I would read the stories out loud to her. And if she kind of wandered off, I would know, well, maybe that's a little boring. In fact, sometimes she would say, mom, I think you think girls are interested in that, but they're not. (laughs) And I also early on learned that my husband was totally unreliable. I would read the stories out loud to him and he would, tears would course down his cheeks. He loved everything. So he was not a good person to read aloud to either because he just thought everything was so good that, that I couldn't trust him to say that if he didn't think something was working. And I would always keep Um, I would always keep Pleasant in mind, also Pleasant Roland, because she was a wonderful teacher and editor. And I I knew that she, if I was getting too complicated, too arcane, too fancy for, too smart for my own good, that she would zero right in on that kind of um, nonsense. So I, she would always sort of, even though she wasn't present, she would keep me honest because she was always in my heart and my mind as I, as I wrote. There's a, uh, I, I I chuckled when you mentioned your husband and how he was just such a fan yes. of, of everything that you did, um, because we need those people in our lives as creative people. You need people that 
that tell you that everything you do is amazing. And they they truly believe that, you know, I, yes. I, I think very sweet. It, it is very sweet. And and there are times, uh, you, you know, because a writer's life can be kind of dark. You know, you you spend a lot of time by yourself and and people don't get to see what you've done until you've already invested, you know, maybe hundreds of hours into it. And you know, it, it can uh, sometimes the feedback that you get can be harsh. And so you need those people in your life that encourage you and, and all that. But you also need to know that these are the people that are only going to give you positive yes. feedback no matter what. And and keeping, you know, those people in, in their proper place is is important. <laughs> One of the things I love about writing is it's starting from zero every time, every, time. every day that I sit down. Every day, it's starting from zero. You cannot rest on your laurels. You can't say, oh, I know how to do this. It's always starting from zero. And I love that because there's a certain honesty about that. I even like the slightly scary element of that kind of like, you know, how am I going to do this? And I, I like that. I like that challenge that it's completely new every time. Absolutely. So you, you told us about this fortuitous meeting um, at, at the school uh, assembly where you're, you're reading and, uh, and, and you meet uh, your connection with uh, National Geographic. And then before we know it, the uh, Izzy Newton comes out of this meeting. Um, how did you how did you come uh, across the character of Izzy and why was she the perfect protagonist for the series? Well, Becky had already sort of planned out, she had already made up the title for the series and she'd sort of planned out that there would be, I think she had seven different characters. So through that wonderful process of back and forth, we kind of winnowed it down to five. And originally, actually, Allie, the girl who's interested in math, Allie Einstein was going to be the main character. But here's what happened. Izzy turned out to be the perfect main character because she's a little unexpected. She's an introspective girl. She's quiet. She doesn't like being the center of attention. And that makes her a very interesting protagonist. In fact, she dislikes being the center of attention. She turned out to be the perfect sort of objective correlative in my head for physics, which is the science of how things are put together and held together. And Izzy's the force that holds that disparate group, that very diverse group of five friends together. And she's the one who won't give up on a friendship. And she's the one who won't let them give up when many, many of their experiments have flopped and failed and turned out not to work. So she, so the fact that her personality mirrors her interest in physics made her the perfect a leading character, much to our surprise, actually. I love it when something like that happens, when a character kind of quietly tugs you on your sleeve and says, excuse me, no, I'm I'm the character you want. And you're like, gosh, you're right, Izzy. <laughs> she turned out to be a wonderful lead character. That's amazing. Who are the smart squad? Well, there's Izzy Newton, and her character is based on Isaac Newton, who was also introspective and quiet. And then I did some sort of funny things like Isaac Newton's best friend was called John Wickens. So I gave Izzy a cat named Wickens, and they both play the flute. And then her best, she has a best friend named Allie Einstein, who loves math, who, and whose philosophy is the more the merrier. And she just piles on and takes really takes on more than she really should, could. She's very exuberant the way um, Albert Einstein was also very exuberant. And then there is Charlie Darwin, who loves the out of doors and animals and plants and anything to do with nature. And like Charles Darwin, she's a great outdoors person. And she has a lot of confidence, actually. Charlie has a lot of confidence. And then there's Marie Curie, obviously named after Marie Curie, who loves chemistry. And she's mercurial. She's changeable the way chemical solutions are. And she likes to sort of morph her appearance. You know, she'll dye a streak of her hair pink and then green and then purple. And she's chemical. Marie is chemical. I love that about her. She loves to mix things up literally and figuratively. And then there's Gina Carver, who's named after George Washington Carver, who is a wonderful inventor. She likes to build things. And I love Gina because she makes the point that chaos is an essential part of the creative process and you can't be neat 
all the time. And then Gina certainly is not neat and tidy all of the time. And from that willingness to be at ease with mess and uncertainty, she's able to create wonderful robots and she has great ideas and she is very, she thinks in three dimensions. And I love that about Gina. They're all so different from one another. I love that about them. So what does, uh, what does smart uh, in the smart squad stand for? (laughs) Smart S M A R T stands for solving mysteries and revealing truths. So in every book, there are those two strands, really. There's the straightforward mystery. In the first book, it's why is our school building so cold? And then there's a mystery. Why is a chilliness springing up between two of the friends in this group? And that's revealing truths. That's where it's kind of the science of human behavior. And you find out on a series of misunderstandings, why people have had sort of a falling out and don't feel like, I feel as though they can be friends anymore. And Izzy's very determined to solve the straightforward mystery of why the school is cold and not to give up until that friendship is also healed. That, that is amazing how, and this goes back to, to that idea of layered stories that we talked about earlier, where we have the, um, the, the kind of scientific mystery, the things that we can, we can use clues, uh, to, to, um, to gather information and then to, to, to work out the problem. And, and then the, the sort of, uh, the, the, the human, um, yes relationship there that's that's more nuanced and and it is not exactly things we can put our hands on uh right. but we we have to solve these sort of mysteries with our heart um if, if you yeah. want to look at it that way and um again with the with the layered nuance of, of a story that uh that that connects you know such broad swaths of people i was so uh, in, influenced by my lunch bunch, this group of sixth grade girls that I had lunch with. And uh, I would bring cookies and they would just tell me what was going on in their life. And some of it was very subjective. It was, we're having a lot of trouble keeping up with the homework because we have different teachers for every class and this teacher doesn't know what that teacher gave. So some of it was very straightforward, the difference between elementary school and middle school. And then these girls were so reflected they had reflective they had the ability to sort of pull back a little bit and see the changes and patterns and the things that they were proud of that they were being asked to do and they could also talk about changes in amongst themselves there were eight eight girls and they could talk about the shifts and changes in the friendships they were they were very very impressive very articulate girls and so they they taught me just by listening to them, I deserve no credit for this. All I did was listen to them. They taught me about layers. They taught me about intertwining straightforward, subjective things that were going on with these more elusive, but no less important to them, things that were more subjective. Valerie, the the books that you wrote in the American Girl series, um, a, a lot of those are historical fiction and um, take place in a previous time, and and you know of course have all of the um, uh, the uh, the trappings of uh, of a historical story. And then the the new book with Izzy Newton um, is more of a present day story, and we're we're dealing with. Um, you know, science and and more cutting edge um, topics, uh, and, and making those palatable to, uh, you know, to um, you know, eight to twelve year old, you know, kids. Um, what are the difference in in approaching these types of stories with a, uh, a historical story versus a modern story? Is is it a difference in in how you approach it? Um, kind of, what do you do to get in the proper mindset for? Um, dealing with the audience that, that you're going to be writing for? Uh, in some ways, the, the, it was exhilarating to me to be writing uh, stories that took place in the 21st century um, because in the 21st century, these girls will have access to the internet. So, you know, basically they have access to all the information whether it's true or not, all the information on the internet is, you know, from all over the whole universe. And that was exhilarating to me that they could, you know, do research and find answers to things that the world, in some ways the world was uh, larger 
for them. So that was a that was a an interesting difference. Also, a difference that from the get go, and I don't know whether this was because the stories were taking place in the 21st century, it was very important to me from the beginning to stress collaboration. I really wanted to show in the Izzy Newton stories how a team benefits from having uh, members who have very different interests and skills and that you respect those differences and those quirks because you don't know which, it's the synergy of all of them that help you come to a solution. Whereas American Girl, that was one main character and she was Everything revolved around her and she made everything happen. So that was that was a difference, too. And I don't know whether that was because the Izzy Newton stories take place today. And I'm so aware of how important it is for all of us to help each other. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But my approach from the very beginning, I would say, for both series was sort of the same, that really the root comes from my reader and respect for my reader and my inspiration inspiration comes from there as well that I want my reader to become friends with my character. So everything ha- that happens to the character matters to my reader. So if the, if the differences are the visible roots and branches of the stories, the roots of the stories, I would say are kind of the same, that my approach would be the same to be sure that I was writing a story that was authentic. And, you know, Hank, you can't sprinkle authenticity on afterwards that no. that has to be right there from the get-go you can't it's not dust that you are sparkles that you can it, it, and that my lunch bunch girls really helped me so much with the izzy stories to be sure that they were authentic and and realistic so um i'm i always like to be sure i'm not writing anything that's going to seem phony or false or impossible for girls really to do, or that the girls are just so noble that they're not like any real girls I've ever met. So really, really the inspiration and the authenticity stems straight from my readers. And if I'm lucky enough to spend time with them, uh, then that's where the, that's where the stories spring from. Well, Absolute Hero is book one in this new series. Um, what do you have planned for this series, Valerie? Well, I've already written the second book in the series, and um, I just think the art, Geneva Bowers is the artist, and I just love her art. I love the way she's, you get to know these girls just by looking at her illustrations of them. I don't know how artists do that. It's just brilliant to me. So Geneva's working on the art for this second book that we have finished. That one is called Newton's Flaw, and Izzy has a flaw which, you know, our vices are always the excesses of our virtues. And I've told you that she's introspective and shy and quiet. And she is very fearful of speaking in front of a group. And she has an elective class called forensics. And she's happy because she thinks it's forensics like on a TV show, for, you know, solving crimes. And her friends say, uh-oh, no, it's this, in this case, forensics means speech and debate. And sure enough, she's expected to make speeches in front of the class and she just can't bring herself to do it. She just freezes. So that's her flaw that she has to overcome. And it's paralleled in the solution of the mystery. Um, There's a flaw in the foundation of the school and the girls have to solve the mystery as what's what problems are being caused by that, how they can resolve the problems and how they can rescue some of the things that have been damaged because of this flaw in the foundation. Well, the new book is uh, called Izzy Newton and the Smart Squad. Absolute Hero is book one in the series. I can't wait to see where you take this, uh, Valerie, and to see all of the great stuff that's going to come out uh, from this. There, there are links to this book in the show notes of the episode where you can go find it easily. Um, Valerie, if people are fascinated by your story as I am and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, uh, where can they find you online to dig into all of uh, all of your back catalog and everything that you're doing? Well, um, I'm on uh, Goodreads and there's a profile of me on Amazon. And also National Geographic has written a very nice um, background paragraph, which you can find at nationalgeographic.com. And I would recommend going there because it also has more information about Izzy and her friends and wonderful illustrations. And it has information about Geneva 
um, Bowers, our artist, I always like to include the girls who are interested in the visual arts, you know, not just writing, but the visual arts as well. And so that would be a good place to go if you were, you know, a person who was curious about me and a curious and curious about Geneva and curious about the members of the Smart Squad. I'd, I'd start there, nationalgeographic.com. Excellent. We'll include links uh, to all those places in the show notes where people can easily find them. Um, this has been so much fun uh, talking and, and learning all about the new project, Valerie. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I have loved this conversation. Thank you so much, Hank. It's a pure pleasure. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. It draws on tried-and-true, tested theory that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Do you ever wonder if a person's critical thinking comes at the expense of their own happiness? Is it possible to be very happy and still practice excellent discernment? I used to wonder the same thing. Then I discovered the Trouble in Paradise podcast with Nigel Kent and Jasmine Starr, where they laugh as well as think about conspiracy theories and unexplained phenomena without ever getting bogged down in the age-old tug-of-war between logic and feeling. The Trouble in Paradise podcast is a joyful program for critical thinkers who have a sense of humor. Join Nigel and Jasmine as they probe the intriguing and wacky culture of odd occurrences, strange news, and ridiculous coincidences on this hilariously intelligent podcast. Trouble in Paradise on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Stitcher. Follow at TipCast239 on Twitter. Trouble in Paradise with Nigel Ken and Jasmine Starr, a happy podcast for critical thinkers like you.